that. This used to be the boys' dorm here, and I could tell you stories, even though I wasn't in the boys' dorm, but one of my favorite was about one of my best friends, how uh, one morning he was yelling out the window towards the quad, help, I can't get out of my, do out of my, out of my dorm room, and the reason why is because other guys in the dorm went and got some bricks and mortar that, uh, from the building that they were building and completely bricked his door up <laughs> overnight. So, you know, it's crazy stuff being around here, but boy, I love just... Um, I love the fact that this is Beeson and what God's doing through all of this. I, I do work with Perspectives Global, so if you don't know about the course Perspectives on the World Christian Movement, it is a, I'll just give you a quick, quick, fast introduction. It is a 15-week course that is held in cities uh, in the U.S. And, and increasingly cities in the world uh, sponsored by churches that come together of various denominations and streams. And uh, it is a vision course that awakens people to what God is doing in the earth, what he has been doing for his name and for his glory throughout history and today. And uh, the whole goal of Perspectives is not just to awaken the church, but to engage the church in God's mission, however God created each one. So it's my privilege to be able to, um, to partner with them all these years. So a few years ago, I was uh, in the United Arab Emirates and I was actually teaching uh, a string of perspectives courses there, and my husband went with me, and we were going to go out into the Arabian Desert for this adventure. And it started with this dune buggy adventure, which was absolutely craziness because they were turning over on two legs, two two wheels like this, and the more we would scream, the more radical the driver got and I really thought we were going to flip uh wild excitement but my thing I was looking for the most was uh being out in that nighttime with no lights and looking at in the desert at the stars and uh unfortunately I was disappointed because it was a cloudy night that night and then there was just a lot of dust in the desert I've always been fascinated with uh stars I know um, when I was here at Sanford, I took the course that everybody called Physics for Dummies uh, because I was horrible at science. And, uh, and it was a Jan term course, but all I think I can remember was the astronomy class and the stars. And so um, I, I was thinking about that and how uh, God took Abraham 4,000 years ago out in the desert. And can you just imagine what that was like? So Abraham, maybe he was fast asleep. They'd been having a conversation. And maybe God says, wake up, Abram. Come outside. I got something to show you. And so Abraham shuffles outside, and he says, look. Look up at the star stars. Count them if you can. And can you imagine, Abraham, you know, you're going to obey God. One, two, three, four, ten, a hundred, a hundred and one, hundred, three hundred, five. I can't, God. There's just too many. And God responds, so shall your descendants be. Now, God had given a promise to Abraham that through him and his descendants, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And the blessed, we know that's not the way we think of, oh, I'm blessed with wealth and blessed with a nice house. And blessed, blessed was the shalom. It was the goodness. It was the peace. It was the justice that God intended for society. But, of course, Abraham alone and his family, the Israelites, could not be the full fulfillment of this mandate to bless all the nations of the earth. And so Galatians clearly tells us, Galatians 3, that we as believers in Christ are the seed of Abraham. And therefore, that same promise and that same mandate is given to us as the seed of Abraham, as the descendants of Abraham, to bless all the nations of the earth. So um, God, if you look at all of this as like a storyline, um, God gave this promise to Abraham 4,000 years ago. He gives us a peek at the end of the story in Revelation through the vision of John. And we see the fulfillment uh, of Abraham's, uh, the promise given to Abraham. We see the galaxy filled, if you will. Uh, and who are they in this galaxy? They're from every tribe and every people, every language. There they are before the Lamb, redeemed, and they're worshiping Jesus. So this is what God was aiming towards. This is what God meant when he spoke this promise to Abraham. And these last 2,000 years have been about populating the galaxies in Abraham's vision. But just as, you know, light or dust or clouds can obscure our vision of the stars, like it did for me that night in the Arabian Desert, 
so the light of all of our busyness and activity or the clouds of despair, the clouds of the darkness of the world can obscure our vision of what God is doing in the world right now in our generation in bringing about the fullness of this vision among the nations. And so I want, this is what I want to bring tonight, or today, sorry, I usually speak at night, <laughs> bring today in terms of uh, what is our God doing, and just a drill down into one particular story, but, but with a bigger picture as well, to populate this galaxy of Abraham's vision with the, with the peoples from all the nations and all the tribes. Um, but before I uh, get to that point, let's just get the context. How many people were at uh, Gina Zerlo's uh, combo this morning. It was just tremendous. I it was it was this. It was funny because I was preparing this and I was going to do a bit on world trends and what is Gina doing? World trends. <laughs> but from a demographic standpoint, it's like this is awesome. Uh, so uh, we're going to do a little bit of that. But let's look historically. Christianity from Israel it started as an Asian religion, right? But it immediately went to the north toward Europe and it spread across the north of Europe. And it began to spread also the south and east, but then it began to recede greatly because of all the Muslim invasions, because of the Mongol invasions, because of the religious persecution. The church uh, and the faith of Christ grew smaller and smaller in the east and in the south. Uh, and so Christianity began to be seen as a Western religion. And um, the white Westerner sort of thing, that's who a Christian is, right? And so that's still the mentality of the peoples of the world all over still in fact sometimes even us um, but that is not the case anymore and you see here on this graph around in the year 1800 only about one percent of all believers lived outside of Europe and the North America but then in just 100 years 10 percent of believers but then look what happens in the next 100 years fascinating Two-thirds of all believers in Jesus live outside of Europe and the North America. So we now have this global church, which is the reality of what the globe is. Wouldn't it be awful if you got to heaven and everybody looked just like you? You know, that would be such a, a, a small piece. But God created all the languages and the peoples and the diversities and the colors and the beauties and the, and the music and the art and the drama. It's all so different. And God loves that, that beautiful creativity that he put within the world. And that's what, who he is wanting to populate his forever family with. Not one piece missing because we'd be missing the beautiful, beautiful tapestry of God's awesome creation. And it would also uh, not be what he was saying, that it's going to go to every tribe and nation. So um, the gospel is flowing in many places outside the West. But it's also, we're seeing sons and daughters for Jesus come from some of the most resistant populations that we have historically been resistant to the message of Christ. And we're seeing things today that missionaries only two to three generations ago would have dreamed about. The galaxies, if you will, of Abraham's vision is being populated in our generation. If you look at this chart right here, this is estimated populations from 10,000 BCE to 2100. Look at the radical curve right there. The stat there is that the population of the world grew less. I'll say it slow so you catch it. The population of the world grew less in 11,900 years than in the last 50 years. So as we as believers reach out to the peoples of the earth and as God works with us and, and peoples respond to Christ, this is heavens being populated more than ever before as they are responding to Christ because of the world that we live in today. Why is that? Why are we seeing these amazing moves of God today? And I wanted to give you a pictorial example of that. This is 100 Iranian former Muslims being baptized together. And I've seen picture after picture after picture just like this. My husband and I support a, a ministry called Elam, which is a Persian-led ministry. And uh, Persians are Iranians, okay? And under the radar that most people don't see, you're not going to hear about it on TikTok or Twitter or you know, the global news media, God is bringing a people to himself from Iran 
But it's only been in the last 50, 60 years that this movement has just been exploding in Iran of thousands upon thousands of Muslims coming to faith in Christ. My husband and I got to attend a, a Persian um, conference down in Houston, Texas just a few years ago, and the room was filled with Persian believers that used to be Muslims. And boy, to be in an environment like that with them worshiping Jesus and uh, it was just fascinating, but we also got to hear their testimonies from those who live who were in prison uh, to um, just um, you know the average person. But I was most I was most fascinated by two things. One, the the believers in uh, Iran said, "Why is the gospel flowing throughout Iran so radically?" And they said, "Because everybody's expected to be an evangelist and to share the gospel." And two, because we believe what the Scripture says that it's granted to us to suffer as part of our faith. And he says, so we embrace that. And uh, no matter what comes, we will live out the faith that Christ has given us. And this one lady said, I was taught to share my testimony. She was a young woman. She said, I was taught to share my testimony in 30 minutes, three minutes, and three seconds. Three seconds? How can you share your testimony in three seconds? And she says, well, it's kind of easy. You're driving down the street, your passenger window's open, you have stacks of, of uh, Persian New Testaments in your front, front seat, and Jesus films, the car pulls up next to you at the light, their driver's window's down, and you pick up a New Testament, throw it in the window, and drive on. <laughs> and they're doing this all over Iran, sharing the gospel just with everybody they can. It's no wonder we've seen this, but the, it's also a movement of the Holy Spirit working uh, on behalf of his purpose today i just finished a, a book in which i uh let me i'll clip over here if the camera follows i don't know i um i i did a sweeping overview of the last 50 years of frontier mission working among uh the frontier peoples where the gospel has not gone and looking at key trends over these last 50 years which helps us understand why the gospel has moved so far uh and so quickly uh, especially outside the West, but we're seeing in the West too, particularly among the refugee populations that are coming in. And I wanted to go through uh, just a few of those trends uh, so that we can see why is this, um, this great move of God, why are so many peoples responding to the gospel uh, today in waves, waves of Muslims coming to Christ, waves of Hindus coming to Christ, waves of Buddhists coming to Christ. Now, it doesn't mean that, that it's, it's like massive populations but it's in ways that have never been seen in history and here's a few of the things that um that are trends that are led to this in the last 50 to 70 years because god is the author of history god is oversees history so he utilizes all the um the trends and the things that are happening in history for his glory and for his purpose so one is the collapse of colonialism um, the, the world just collapsed. Dr. W uh, Ralph Winter wrote a book called The 25 Unbelievable Wor uh, Years in which the whole world changed from a colonial-dominated world to an independent nation world. And when that happened, then the peoples were rising up to want to not only take over their nations from the colonial governments, but to take back their churches as well. The churches had been birthed, and they want to lead their churches. And so um, there was this new wave of independency and the churches uh, growing and, and wanting to begin to, to, um, to develop themselves according to their culture and according to their um, uh, indigenous ways of thinking. So you have the collapse of colonialism, but then you have the rise of communism and authoritarianism. And you can think of Russia or China or Eastern Europe. Uh, what did communism do? Well, communism is atheistic at its core. And so where it, where it rose up in these great empires, if you will, like China or Russia, um, they stamped out religion. Not just Christianity, but Buddhism and Islam. And it was, um, they called uh, religion the opiate of the peoples. And therefore, they were stamping out religion. And when you have 70 years of communism, you have an entire generation that eventually becomes just agnostic, atheistic, is there a God, doesn't know anything. And what that does is it creates an incredible spiritual vacuum. I spent 1994 in Russia uh, right after the fall of the Soviet Union, and the vacuum and hunger 
to know, is there really a God, was just vast. We could preach on the streets and get a crowd that was wanting to know. So that vacuum that communism created uh, to know, is there a God, and, and, and who is he, and how does he relate to me, was part of the... Um, uh, the things that God used in, in um, China itself, when the missionaries were kicked out in 1949, the indigenous church exploded. And what we thought might be the end of the church actually ended up being the birth of a very large Chinese church uh, under communism. And then in 1989 and 92, you have a collapse of communism. So that allows then an open door for the, the Jesus to be preached in all of these lands. And even in China, they were so open for Western education and, and technology and trade that they would just, they, I, I talked to Christian teachers who were teaching in China. They said, they know we're Christian, but they want to know English so bad, they just kind of turn a blind eye. Uh, now that's not as much the case today as it was then because the restrictions have been reimposed, not just in China, but in in uh, Russia and some other places. Another trend is globalism. So it's bringing the cultures together uh, with global business, global trade, all that. So you have cultures interacting. Uh, and so you have business people. My, when I worked at uh, Dell as a brand new company, you know, my, my senior VP was a uh, Japanese. Uh, my uh, best colleague was uh, is Jewish. My, you know, we had different people working, and so the, your cultures are interacting with opportunities for um, evangelization right there with your friends or with your neighbors or so forth. Um, technology, that's huge. I don't think I have to say a lot about that because we're all very aware of how the internet, the mobile phone, um, uh, satellite TV, all those things have opened the world up, but has allowed the gospel to flow into places that. Um, the government would love to pre prevent. In fact, the, the Church of Iran, they have worship services in their languages. Uh, they have uh, coming in. If you can't meet publicly, then you're meeting in your living room and you're able to worship in Persian. And uh, with others, they have discipleship mechanisms through just through the mobile phone. I've been so many places in the world in the most rural areas, and everywhere I go, there's mobile phones. They've just jumped over the industrial revolution straight into the technological revolution. Urbanization and migration, that's huge. We're in one of the greatest uh, refugee crises in the world uh, right now. The peoples are moving everywhere. And so, again, that global contact with peoples. Uh, Syrian refugees moving out of Syria, and they're coming to faith in Christ. Iranians moving out of Iran, they're leading Syrians to Christ. <laughs> they're leading Afghanis to Christ. Uh, Afghani church is the fastest growing church in the world today the Afghani church. The Persian church is the second fastest growing. Islamization, how is that a trend that helps uh, the spread of the gospel? Because uh, Muslim terrorism impacts Muslims the most, and they're getting the brunt of it. And therefore, so many hearts have been opened up to, is this, what, is this, is this truth? Is this what I want to believe? And so there's more of a questioning and opening and a, and a willingness to talk to Christians and to read Christian material, and it's opened up the hearts of so many Muslims. The very thing that Satan means for evil, God turns around and uses for good. So these are some of the uh, geopolitical trends. What about some mission trends that are leading to helping us partner with God with what he's doing in this generation and seeing these, um, the peoples come to him? Well, we're kind of in the third wave of mission sending. If you look at the first wave of mission sending, it was colonial. Uh, missionaries went to the coastlands of the world because that's where it had been explored. Uh, and then the second wave was uh, internal, coming into the interior of all the countries. And in every one of those ways, you had new mission thinking, new mission organizations rise up in order to um, address that need. And now we're in the third wave where there is a, um, a recognition of uh, all the people groups, the language groups, the ethnocultural groups within every language, uh, within every country. Here's an example from my own personal life. I grew up in a Southern Baptist church, and I was part of a girls' missions organization. And one of the things we had to do, kind of like what Girl Scouts do, you know, you reach levels of um, of accomplishment. And so I well remember standing before my church as a 12-year-old girl uh, on a Wednesday night, and I was disposed to. Um, I was supposed to recount by memory 
every single nation that Southern Baptists had missionaries in from A to Z. And there was like over 100. And I stood there dutifully going through the alphabet of every nation that Southern Baptist had missionaries in. And I looked back at that, and I was like, but what does that mean? We have missionaries in India, so what? What people group? What language group? What village? What area? You know, they're only going to touch this little bit, but you got all these other Indians, millions, that would not even be touched by the fact that the gospel's spreading in this little piece. So that's what this whole understanding of unreached people groups, understanding of the nations is not a political nation. Dr. Ralph Winter said this in 1974 at the Lausanne Congress. He says, the fact that the church is planted in every country in the world has obscured the fact that thousands of people have little to no access to the gospel. So shifting from a geopolitical understanding of nation to the unreached peoples led to uh, lots and lots of research of who they are, where they are. When I first took the perspectives course uh, in Texas, uh, which, by the way, is a 15-week course in which you're exposed to this great big thing that God is doing. And when I took it, the thing that impacted me the most, because I had grown up in a mission-minded church, but what impacted me the most was the fact that here I am in the computer industry, I was working at Dell, and we now, because of technology, can research and count and understand where and who every people group is in the world, and do they have the gospel in their midst? Is there a missionary in their midst? Do they have the scriptures? Do they have the Jesus film? What do they have to enable them to know who Jesus is? And once we see that picture, then we can address all those Areas that are blank, that don't have anything. And so that is this third wave of mission. Uh, there's no resources. There's no church. Um, let me give you an example here that's just to Birmingham in terms of lack of resources. Birmingham, this is a recent statistic. Birmingham has 459 churches, whereas the same size city in Uzbekistan, Samarkand, Uzbekistan, has zero churches the resources to know Jesus is abundant where we live if you lived in that city in Uzbekistan there's not a single church representing your culture proclaiming Jesus Christ that's what an unreached people area and group is and so the focus to go there uh, this focus on the frontiers really caught the global church. I lived through all of this uh, and just seeing the spread in Ghana and in Nigeria and in uh, Korea and so forth where they, they embraced this vision to research and find out uh, who are the unreached people groups. I have a, a, an original book from, uh, that the Indian, all the Indian organizations work together to do to research every village and every town and every language in there so that they would know where do we need to go with missions. So this is what has helped us focus on where the gospel isn't so that we don't dump all of our resources into where the gospel already is. And with this third wave came uh, new, um, new mission agencies, new associations, global networks, focused on the frontiers, focused on specialized mission, uh, global networks working together, new ways of sending, uh, no longer was it the missionary family that went and spent the rest of their life there, but we would send teams or a uh, business's mission. People would go with their companies, of course, short-term mission boom. Uh, but not just that. Now the largest sending is from the non-Western world. There are more non-Western missionaries today than there are Western missionaries, and that is a wonderful thing. And as Gina said in, in the um, uh, convocation this morning, the big change now is for we as Westerners to know how to partner with that. Instead of us, we're so used to Westerners. We're so used to telling everybody what to do. Like, we know when we go into another culture, but we know. And we have to realize that we need to come in as fellow travelers along this road, and we have very much to learn from them. We have to learn from them. Uh, but they have a lot to teach us as well. It's about global Christianity. And then there's globalization and mobilization. I'm a mobilizer at heart. And uh, it used to be that that was uh, something that was kind of in the West, uh, mobilize the church for mission. But now I meet with global mobilizers all over the world regularly, that, and they have caught that vision, uh, particularly the Brazilians, let me just say. They are saying, we have got to mobilize this huge 
Brazilian church to understand how God has uniquely gifted them to go to the nations, particularly in, in North Africa. And um, so we're seeing amazing things happen with that. Student movements, uh, huge student movements are mobilizing students to the, to, the, to the world, but this is the most significant, I think, is global prayer movements. There are incredible global prayer movements all over the world, and it, when we pray, God answers. And that's why, that is really the ultimate reason why we're seeing such a massive move of God today. So in the 1990s, I was working in mission mobilization, and a thing came out called um, Praying Through the Window. And it was praying through the 1040 window, the most least reached and uh, the neediest places on earth, uh, which is basically the middle of the, the globe. And um, millions upon millions upon millions of Christians all over the world, it got bigger every year, would spend that, spent that entire decade praying through the window. They were praying for the Muslim peoples, the Hindu peoples, uh, the Buddhist peoples that were in that land. And after the 1990s, that's when we started seeing a beginnings of turnings of whole populations, uh, of uh, whole tribes of Muslims beginning to start embracing Christ in these movements. And why? Well, yeah, we're using some better strategies, but that isn't it. It's because we prayed. It's because the world was praying, and God answered. And he lines up all these things together to bring it together. Uh, in terms of new strategies, Back in the 1950s, 60s, Dr. McGavern said, I was asking the question, how do peoples become Christian? He was focusing on the cultures and the way things, that boundaries that separate peoples from one another. He says, how do we, how do we, we can't just bring a Western gospel. How do the peoples become Christian? And then Dr. Townsend, uh, Cameron Townsend, starter of Wycliffe Translators, um, he said, how many languages are there without the gospel? These were not questions that were being asked before. This was new. And then Dr. Winter, Ralph Winter, brings some of that, a lot of that together. And he says, well, okay, the cultures, the languages, the, the caste, how many people groups are there in the world? And that's what kind of got that ball rolling. And then David Garrison um, wrote a book in the early 2000s and, and, uh, which he calculated or he researched and he sh gave um, very specific cases of how God's working in the Muslim world. And he asked the question, are we expecting too little? If all this time we've been expecting too little to happen. And that, that was a motivator for so many of us. And then the last hearing here is just the activity of God himself. You know, in Habakkuk it says, look among the nations, observe, watch. Because I'm doing something, I think it'd be applied today, I'm doing something in your day uh, that you would, you would just be astounded. You wouldn't believe. Uh, Dr. Uh, Henry Blackaby said in his experience in God book watch to see where God is working and join him so I want to give you a story that you will see these trends working to bring Mongolian peoples to Christ I am picking up um, from two main resources of stories uh, from Rick Leatherwood's book and then from Brian I've met Rick uh, I know Brian, Brian Hogan's book, There's a Sheep in My Bathtub, and there are stories of how the gospel was first coming to the Mongolian people. Uh, there were three waves of the gospel coming into Mongolia. The first was under Genghis Khan. He married a Christian uh, uh, princess from a tribe, and he's the mother, uh, she was the mother of Kublai Khan. And when the Pol Marco Polo's father came in uh, to China, um, Kublai Khan said, hey, send me a hundred teachers of your religion. I want to know what it is that you're believing. If it's a superior religion, we'll all embrace it as Mongols. The Mongols rule the largest empire the world has ever seen. And so the Polos went back, and the church never sent anybody. They never came. So that was the first missed opportunity. So the Chinese conquered Mongolia, and in order to pacify the Mongolians, they introduced uh, a very pacifist religion called Tibetan Buddhism. And under 500 years of Chinese rule, the Mongolians were totally pacified, but they were totally entrenched with Buddhism. It was fa the fabric of their very soul. So when James Gilmore, the first Protestant ministry, came to uh, Mongolia in 1872, sent from Scotland, even though he did everything right, learning language and culture and living like a Mongolian, when he lay dying 21 years later, he bemoaned 
that he could only count his converts on one hand. Buddhism was that entrenched in the Mongolian mind. Well, when the Russian Revolution happened, the Mongolians asked the Russians to come help them throw off the yoke of the Chinese, which they did. And it was basically taking one yoke and replacing it with another. It was more harsh. And so in the 1930s, Stalin and the communists raised all the Buddhist monasteries in the land. They killed all the Buddhist priests by the tens of thousands in a countrywide bloodbath. They eradicated Buddhism from the land. The, the um, communists ruled for 70 years. And so this eradication, again, is another generation. But they did bring some modernity to Mongolia. Before 1921, in Mongolia, picture this. There were no schools, no hospitals, no banks, no roads, no transportation except for horses. Not even uh, houses and buildings. The only buildings were the monasteries and the very elite's houses. That was it. Everybody lived in yurt tents uh, in Mongolia herding their uh, cattle and sheep. Almost the entire population was, relit uh, was illiterate. But the 70-year occupation of the Soviet Union changed all that, and that paved the way for then the gospel to come uh, when communism was lifted. And so in um, 1987, uh, God gave a vision to Rick Leatherwood about taking a group of Native Americans to Mongolia. He worked on a Native American tribe, and he, he realized that they looked very much like the Mongolians. And so he took a couple of Native Americans. These, uh, uh, they had an a, a ancient story that their peoples had come across the land bridge across Alaska down to uh, America. And uh, so they went, and as they met, this is 1987 before the fall of the Soviet Union, as they met some of these Mongolians, they found out they cooked their food the same way. They had some similar words. They lived in similar housing. But here was the, cl uh, the clincher. And they also had a story, by the way. Uh, the Native Americans told, asked the Mongolians, they said, Do your, are your babies born with a little blue dot in the middle of their back? And the Mongolians go, yes. And that clinched it. They were from the same people group, the Native American tribes as the Mongolians. And so that opened doors then for these Native Americans. More of them came. Uh, Rick began to share the, the gospel, and um, they... Um, there it became friends with the tour guide that they had. His name was Mr. Boyo. And Rick, before he left, the day before he left, he sensed the Holy Spirit speaking to him and said, Jesus saying, tell him about me now. And so Rick asked Mr. Boyo, what do you know about Jesus Christ? And Mr. Boyo replied, Jesus Christ, who is he? Does he live in the United States? And Rick got to share the gospel with Mr. Boyo and right before they left he gave his life to Christ he was transformed and when they came back it was able to bring more Native Americans and be able to share with more people and as far as we know Mr. Boyo was the very first Mongol Christian since pretty much in history because when even when it was under Kublai Khan it was mainly the elite it was not the common people uh, that if they knew any Christianity so when the Berlin Wall came down in 1989 without, by the way, a gunshot, there was hardly any bloodshed when Eastern Europe was freed from Soviet communism. There is no way to attribute that except for the power of God and the answers to prayer of God's people over all these decades. And the Mongolians wanted their own freedom. And so they went and gathered 100,000 in front of the, uh, the parliament building and asking for communist leaders to step down. And a leader came outside the building and said, we resign, you all hold democratic elections as soon as possible. No bloodshed, no shot, the prayers of God's people. And so with the, draw, the fall of communism, then the door was opened for emissaries of the gospel to come in, but the door was also opened for Mongolian hearts to hear the truth and to respond, they were no longer under atheist communism. So the first missionaries to enter outer, uh, outer Mongolia in 70 years arrived in late August 1990, 1990. And through evangelism and divine healings, God was with them and Mongolians started responding to Christ. The first 34 Mongolians were baptized in 91. Uh, Rick arranged for Paul Eshelman to translate the Jesus film into the Mongolian language. 
and it premiered in January 1992, and it was a big deal. I got to be a part of the premiere of the Jesus film in the Latvian language that was also under communism, and it was the first film in Latvian, and all the dignitaries were there. And um, I sat right behind these huge Russian bosses, and when it got to the uh, crucifixion, their shoulders just shook like this as they wept. And you couldn't hear a word in the room, but all you heard was sobs as people saw Jesus being crucified for the first time because they had been under communism. Same kind of thing with Mongolism, uh, with Mongolia. Uh, the missionaries contextuated, contextualized the gospel and the cult uh, culture. They were trying to use the newest and the latest strategies. They were helping the Mongolians learn to interpret their own scriptures instead of telling the Mongolians, this is how you should apply the scripture. They would instead ask the question, how should you apply this scripture into your context? And so with this, the Mongolian church was being matured instead of being talked down to. They were being matured to learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and make these decisions uh, that what was best in them. And one of the biggest controversies was what name for God should we use? They had an old translation that somebody had done outside of the culture, outside of the country into Mongolian, an old translation of the Bible. And that old translation used a word in Mongolian for God that equated to master of the universe, which sounded Star Wars-ish, you know? It, did not, it didn't communicate to the Mongolians at all. So they asked the Mongolians, what's your word for God? And they gave them their word that they saw as a creator God. Uh, and they thought at first, you know, it was too associated with Buddhism. But in the hearts of the Mongolians, they said, no, this is who we understand, the sky God, the creator God, the one that's over all to be. And so they used that word and created a new translation of the scripture. Uh, and that was in, um, oh, let's see, I don't remember, 1991. And so they introduced this new translation. Uh, it began to also uh, bring forth new worship songs. Uh, using a lot of drama, the culture of the Mongolian peoples. And so more and more people started responding to Christ. Uh, Interdev, which is a global, we talked about partnerships and networks. They brought people together who were working in Mongolia and got to this great prayer meeting all over the world. And then God really started to move in Mongolia. A quick note about what Brian and Louise Hogan experienced. Uh, they were in one particular church in Erdet. And it was started in 1993 with the baptism of 14 teenage girls. But within um, one year, they'd grown to 120. There were signs, wonders, and healings. And uh, they, they raised this church up to learn how to lead themselves. And three years later, they turned over the baton to the Mongolian church, these missionaries, and said, you lead, it's your church, three years they got so much criticism and said, you can't do that. It's a young church. They'll be eaten by the wolves. Uh, they just got all kinds of criticism. They said, no, the Mongolians are ready. And they planned an exit strategy from the very beginning. This is a picture 30 years later of them reenacting. This was just a, a, a year ago of them reenacting this handing over the baton. This Mongolian church has its own theological institutions. It has its own literature. It has its own mission training schools. It has, um, let me see, what's that latest stat? It has at least 25 indigenous mission agencies. Uh, the church has grown very, very strong and into the thousands. So this is an example of what uh, our God is doing today. I was just some others, but I don't have, that's from Burma, but I don't have time to go into those. Um, so we're almost, can I have one minute here? Is the point? Sure. Yeah. Sure. So I want you to see a graph of what the missionary task looks like. This is 2018, but it's the last part of the graph that we could get. Everything, I'll just give you the color. The yellows would be committed Christians or evangelicals. The, uh, the light yellow are, are Christians, those who identify, self-identify, whether they're practicing or not. The green are unbelievers, but they're culturally close to those Christians so they can be evangelized in the same language or culture. But everything blue up there are culturally distant non-believers. And um, those would be what you call the unreached peoples. And so you can see how big of a task it is still. And out of that blue, this is the task of the task. This is the areas that are hardly touched at all. That's the dark blue. Those are those with less than one-tenth of Christians in their own people group and they live in frontier people groups. So this is our most remaining task. They have very little gospel access at all. And our resources are such that we send 
of all our missioning, our, our, our uh, money, and everything to everything that's in yellow and maybe green, and only 1% of all our resources goes to the blue area. And so God's calling us to engage this great task. And one of the ways you can do that, there's a little booklet you can look at called 31. It's the 31 largest, most unreached people groups. And there's a global movement to be praying for those every day, 31 days of the year. So I will uh, let our students okay, go. Yeah, if you're an undergraduate student, Callie is upstairs. She'll have your uh, combo credit for you. Um, for the, the rest of us, I think we got time for, um, I'll have a question or two to ask her. I'm wondering, um, can you tell them just a little bit about um, perspectives of the organization? Sure. And, sure. And uh, uh, like a perspectives course, what that would look like. Okay. I got the textbook here. Hang on. So uh, some of you, you're in Dr. Parks' class. You might recognize this one. Um, this is um, the perspectives reader, but that is not, alone is not perspectives. You have to have both of these two things. This is a study guide that helps you know what to read out of this reader in, in, a, very, um, in a curriculum so that you're following along. Uh, this is filled with um, classic missiologists, frontier missionaries, uh, professors writing all kinds of articles. So, I mean, like, it looks huge. And we dip into an awful lot of it, but we don't read every single part of it. Uh, Perspectives is a 15-week course. So we have, um, as I said, it's in cities with partnerships of churches. But we have a, the uniqueness is we have a different instructor every week. So I've been here in Alabama for the last week teaching in Tuscaloosa and then up in Huntsville and uh, so uh, a different instructor will come next week and teach a different part of the course that sort of thing so the goal is um, that the church not only is awakened to this global purpose and awakened to things like that chart I just showed you you know our resources are being sent to where the church already exists we're not we're not focusing where the church doesn't exist in terms of our resources and so it, that includes prayer uh, do we even know, like, if you ask, where is Mongolia, how many people would be able to tell you, much less I've ever prayed for Mongol, you know? So, um, so it's that awakening and that awareness, but it's also a call to engagement. And so as our programs have gone around the world, we're now in 45 countries, uh, we get to work with the cream of the cop, the, uh, the head of mission associations and organizations in the countries. And I'll just give you one quick example out of Nigeria. It's one of our oldest programs so uh, Nigeria was, uh, the program there was started uh, with the leader of the Nigerian Evangelical Missions Association, or NEMA, Timothy Alande, and he uh, wanted to do a top-down introduction of the course, so he only invited all the uh, heads of pastoral networks and, and denominations, and, uh, and then it began filtering down, so it's all over the country now, but I'll just give you what one of the uh, top leaders of the Anglican Church in Nigeria said he wept when he took this course and he said where has this been he said I, I'm going to command every one of my bishops and priests in Nigeria to take it and so they have been and um, they are now uh, one one pastor said he was leading a network he said okay we only need this many of you working in Nigeria where the church is all the rest of you get ready you're going to the north where the Muslim tribes are and so that's some of the results that we hope to see and that we're seeing coming out of prospectus courses. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else have a question? Okay. There's anybody up there? I can, anything about the world that right. I can answer, I'm glad to. So whatever <laughs> <laughs> that I know, I don't know at all, okay. for sure. All right, thank you so much. Okay, yeah, we have a question here. Ah, you were in Mongolia? Yeah. <laughs> You should be up here telling the stories. <laughs> the ladies group from the Christian Oh, okay. Did tours, excuse me, did tours and things like that. I still have my Genghis Khan uh, keychain with me. Yeah. Uh, we, we were told that uh, well, one of the problems the Mongolians the had in the 1990s and, and into 2000 was that the women, the men was subservient to the women. Did you ever pick that up in my it was a reading? real problem well the the it's, it's kind of true in any i don't know culturally where the women were subservient but it's, it's it would not be unlikely yeah. because that's true in so many cultures 
Are you talking about in the church the, or are you talking it, about in the it culture? Was, uh, it was kind of nationwide that the women, the men were subservient to the women. Oh, the men were subservient to, to the, the women. women. The women were telling the men what to do and the, the men... Don't they do they, that they everywhere? They didn't have any leader. <laughs> really, they didn't have any leadership. The men didn't have any leadership competence because of this. Well, I know that this group here yeah. that we're working, I mean, you see mostly, well, there's about half men. They were raising up men, elders and leaders and pastors of the churches. Uh, but I think they probably have a more equal, equal quality yeah. view of the women and the men. I, can, I mean, I'm not in the depth of their story, so I don't know. I've never been to Mongolia. Everyone, thank you so much for coming. Please show your appreciation, Dr. Honeycutt. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much.